I'm going to talk to you about and share with you. Uh, I uh, want to thank everybody, first of all, for a great sports camp this last week, the week before. Uh, some 22 young uh, children came to Christ, and uh, including the bus driver that was driving all these kids everywhere came to Christ. Yeah, it was really awesome. Yeah. And then the 4th of July party we had down at uh, Kamalani Kai was just awesome. Youth group just had a camping trip right after that. There's just constantly stuff happening, and you guys are invested and involved, and it just makes the whole trip a blessing. Uh, and speaking of trips, uh, I want to I just give you a brief update. Uh, some of you are visiting and you don't know, but I've got cancer. It's very aggressive prostate cancer. It's in my, it's in my prostate, which I don't have anymore. Uh, and it's in, uh, it's in my bladder, and it's metastasized in my lymphatic system. So I'm, I'm charging. I'm, I'm like, I don't do things halfway, I guess. It's like all the way. And in the midst of that, I've got to tell you, it's been the most exciting, wonderful thing that's ever happened to me. I don't have time to tell you all the reasons why or the details, uh, but I'm posting blogs on, uh, with the help of some, uh, Regina and, and my wife, posting some blogs on our website. So if you want to kind of be up to date on that, or you can, uh, you can friend me on Facebook, I'm posting on there. Uh, there. There's so many things that are happening and so many divine appointments, I can't possibly communicate them all to you. But I want to share something with you before our guest speaker comes today and shares the, uh, from the Word. Uh, so this last week, a, a good friend of ours as a church, Barry Smith, uh, had a stroke. And so uh, I wanted to let you know that so you can be praying for him. This guy's been through everything. He had a, uh, in 2011, he had prostate cancer just like me, uh, had all kinds of complications, died on, uh, you know, uh, uh, subsequent to that, had really serious infections, had sepsis, had MRSA, and uh, died three times. And, and he came back. And now he had a stroke. And I went up to visit him the other day. I, I don't know what day that was. It must have been Tuesday or Wednesday when all this happened. And so I, I go up to visit um, uh, Barry. What? Thursday. Was it Thursday? Oh, okay. I'm kind of losing track of time. So Thursday, I go up, I go up to visit him uh, the first time. Had a ball with him. The guy's a riot. We had a really wonderful time, laughed. We were really a disturbance on the floor. And, uh, and then I, I came back. He asked me if I could come back the next day, and I couldn't. But I told him I'll come back the day after, so that was Friday. So I'm coming to the hospital. I, I, I have to go to the bathroom first because uh, I have some continence issues. Uh, they're not bad, but if I laugh a lot, uh, I, I can kind of, you know, like dribble a little bit, you know? And so, so I have to go to the bathroom first before I ever am going to talk with somebody that makes me laugh. So I go to the bathroom, and, uh, and I'm going to the bathroom in the bathroom downstairs. You know at Wilcox before you go up the elevator. So I'm going to the bathroom. And, uh, and there's a guy in there. He's, he's an, old, an old guy, Filipino, Hawaiian, Chinese guy. And, uh, uh, and so I just asked him, I said, so, uh, hey, how, how's your day going? You know, we're washing our hands together at the same time. And he says, good. Uh, and he says, how's your day going? Which is exactly what I wanted him to say. Uh, I've been ruthless with my cancer, man. I've, just, I've been brutal with it. It's like I pull in the cancer card all the time. It's like I use it uh, aggressively for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and now my friends and my family are too, so you can use it too. If you have a paper that's due and you're late or you're going to miss work, or just say, my pastor has aggressive cancer uh, and I couldn't be here on time. So just everybody's using it. Uh, feel free. Uh, I'm using it. And so he asked how I'm doing, and I said, you know what? i got to tell you, I'm, I, I've got really aggressive cancer, and it doesn't look good. I'm going to probably die of this. And he said, really? And I said, but you know what i got to tell you? His name is Paul. I said, Paul, i got to tell you something, that it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. My heart is so filled with joy. I don't even know how to begin to describe to you what God has done in my life through cancer, and it's the bomb. And then I just stop, right, because that's my, I just let that sink in. And he says, uh, he says, what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'm going to go up and visit a friend. And he says, well, my wife has got leukemia, and she's in here for weekly treatments. And, uh, and he said, you know, we said, well, do you want to talk? I mean, he, he just didn't want to stop that conversation. So we went outside and talked. I want to show you a picture of him. Got his permission to take this. This is, um, this is my friend, Paul Levi. Does anybody know Paul in the community? You know Paul? Okay. Uh, so he, born and raised on the island, and then uh, he spent about 40 years in U.S. forestry in Oregon, and then he came back to help his parents who were elderly uh, quite a few years ago and retired here. His wife's name is Catherine. I'd like you to pray for Catherine if you think of me and pray for me. Pray for Catherine and Paul uh, as Catherine has her challenges. So we sat downstairs for about 40 minutes um, as, uh, as we had this conversation, and we got to know each other. He told me his story. I got to share my testimony about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and about what God has done in my life. He actually 
uh, used to go to church and stopped many years ago, probably 40, 50 years ago. Uh, some things happened in his life and happened at church, and he just kind of lost his desire to go and, uh, and felt like there was more community in other locations than there was in the church. And so uh, we talked about that. And what was really cool is that I said, I said, Paul, tell me about the time that you felt most connected uh, in the community. And he began to talk about the Hanabata days. You guys that are in your 50s and, and local, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know. He started talking about, you know, you could go to any home in the neighborhood and you'd get fed. Uh, if you were Kolohe and caused a problem, any parent and adult could spank you anywhere, anytime. You, weren't, you were never safe. Uh, you could surf with your friends and you knew somebody was going to be down at the beach to watch you. I mean, there was just this connection. And Paul was talking about how he really misses those days. And I said, Paul, I said, you know, uh, you can get those back. And he said, really, how? And I said, well, because you know that what made these connections wasn't the culture, it was Christianity, Judeo-Christianity. Because it was the culture that was brought in by the missionaries and the, and the people on the plantations that actually infused and invested this community uh, with uh, morals and ethics and with a sense of... Uh, the golden rule, loving one another as, as, we lo as uh, God loves us and we love ourselves. All these things came from the gospel of Jesus Christ because anywhere you go, it doesn't matter what culture it is, if you're separated from Christ and people don't have the Lord as their life, we know what our, what our, what our propensities are. We're selfish. We're self-absorbed. We can be ruthless. We can be ugly to each other. But it's the gospel that changes lives. And so I got to talk with Paul about that. He got all animated and excited. And I said, you know, Paul, this is a, I, I put my arm around him for this picture, but that's where I was like, I was, I'm, I've lost all my filters. I, you guys are probably, I don't have any filters left. So I'm hugging this guy, He's 76 years old. I bring him right into me. And I said, Paul, the two of us, with God's help, can make a difference. And we can reintroduce that kind of aloha spirit right here on Kauai with the help of a lot of other people who are doing the very same thing. And so, uh, so Paul and I are buddies now. Um, when I was trying to get, I was actually trying to leave because I was still trying to visit Barry, but I had to pick up my wife. She was getting her hair cut, and, uh, and I needed to be back to get her. And I had to call Barry, and I said, Barry, I'm not coming. I had a divine appointment. I'm coming back for you later after I pick up my wife. Uh, Paul uh, didn't want to let go. And uh, so we just sat there for a while like that. It was just amazing. And then, yeah, and then, um, and then Paul kind of looked at me, and I kind of looked at him, and it was like his, he was looking at me like, so is this it, you know? And, I, and I'm like, I could feel it from him, and I said, we should, we should exchange our info. And he said, I'd really like that. So uh, pray for us, because I'm going to have dinner with Paul and Catherine with my wife uh, probably in the next couple of weeks and get to know them. But you know, God is opening up doors for me. Just I have, a, I have 10 or 12 of these every day. Uh, I don't have a job anymore, really. I'm the pastor of the church, but I'm taking a medical leave to kind of, you know, deal with all the cancer and everything. And it's just freed me up to be kind of a nomad, uh, you know, organic Jesus-style ministry person. And I, I got to tell you, I'm having the time of my life. And I feel like we're doing this as a team because I know you're praying for us. You're preparing meals for us. You're, you're loving us. You're encouraging us. You're you're stimulating us and you're responding to the blogs and the Facebook posts and all those things. And what it's doing to us is it's just filling us with strength and power and total joy in what we're doing. And so I, I feel like this is just a big group thing. And my only question to you is, why did I get shoved out to the front? That's the only question I have of this group, big group effort. But uh, it is what it is, and I'm really honored to take that role right now uh, in the ministry. So I wanted to share that with you. And I've got so many other stories that I'd like to share, but... I just kind of felt led, especially as I'm talking about Barry and his wife, Sherry. Please pray for them. Barry's over on Oahu at Rehab of the Pacific. He'll be there for probably three weeks uh, trying to get his right side uh, going again. He's, he's able to speak, able to move his arms, able to move his legs, but his right side is the side that's impacted by that, um, by that stroke. And then that led into this uh, just wonderful new friendship with my, uh, with my brother and dear friend, Paul, uh, and his wife, Catherine. So... Um, thanks for the prayers. Thanks for the partnership. I want to introduce to you um, another good friend that uh, we actually made recently. His name is Dave. His wife is Kim, the Hatfields. And um, they actually, uh, he was a, a Wall Street broker for many years. He retired about 15 years ago, came to Christ about 15 years ago at that same time frame, 
His wife, they, I think they were kind of raised in the church, but not really alive in Christ until uh, that time when they made that transition. And they decided they wanted to completely do something different. And so they decided to really uh, aggressively serve the Lord. So they started going to Kenya, and they started an orphanage and a school. And the name of that school is uh, uh, Maisha Mapia uh, Preschool in Kenya. And uh, they have a website. Uh, I'm sure maybe he'll even mention that today. But, uh, but check it out. It's just unbelievable, you know, the work that they're doing. This is a family that had, uh, you know, everything really that it, you know, a lot of people want in terms of material things. And they kind of ditched it all. God guided and, uh, guided and directed them to uh, leave that lifestyle and then to just aggressively serve the Lord. And so that's what they're doing. They, they own some uh, investment properties here on Kauai, came and visited the church this last uh, year uh, or last semester, really. I think it was just this last semester. I don't know where they are. You're here somewhere. There you are. So I think it was just this last semester you came for one of our block courses to just get refreshed spiritually. And then they just wouldn't go away. I mean, they came to everything. I'd go to par a party here and an event there, and it's like, who keeps inviting you guys to everything? You're like everywhere. They were at the camping trip with a Bible college, and they fell in love with the church, and everybody fell in love with them. And uh, so it's a real joy for us uh, during, you know, this transition for me and time of, uh, of kind of navigating the cancer thing to invite Dave uh, to come and to share from the word. Would you welcome him and welcome his wonderful wife, Kim, as well. We love you guys. Oh, don't think you're getting away without a hug, Bob. <laughs> I take them when I can get them, buddy. Oh, I love you. Lost my... Hi. Hey, everybody. My name's Dave, and uh, it's so great to be here with you on this beautiful morning uh, in Kauai. I'm so encouraged to see people that uh, are actually here worshiping God and just not out surfing or hanging at the beach uh, when you could be. So thank you for coming out. Uh, the next couple of weeks, we're going to cover one of my favorite passages uh, of Scripture. It's the 12th chapter of Romans. And one thing that Bob didn't mention is that a little over a year ago, my wife and I, we sold our house and gave away all our stuff. So we get asked a lot of times, how did you know that God wanted you to do that? And so we're going to answer that question um, later uh, in, the, in the sermon today. But first, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just bow before you, Lord, and acknowledge you as God. We look out at this amazing creation that you've made, and we even look at the stars and everything that you've, you've made, and, and, and we, we think, uh, what are we? What is man that you would care so much about us to send your son? Uh, to sacrifice his life uh, for us. But we're so grateful. Uh, we're so grateful, Lord, for that and so thankful. So as we hear this message today, I just ask that you would uh, free our minds of any distractions that, uh, for me, you would just sweep the pride aside and go ahead, Holy Spirit, and take control. Speak your words. Just use my body. Speak your words. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. So we do run a preschool uh, in Kenya, and the greatest thing about running a preschool is kids. Kids are amazing. Um, they're so much fun. Uh, you, you, you can't have a bad day when you're hanging out with four- and five-year-olds all the time. Uh, by the way, we're going to do slides the old-fashioned way. That's it. Kids are great. Um, they're, they're amazing. Um, I know that uh, when Bob's going to go to prepare a message uh, for you, he's, he's put his time in studying the passage, and I'm sure it gets run through the filter of your own life because uh, God just has a tendency as we, as we do this, as we're going to share the message, to say, hey, I want to make sure you're okay with 
with all of this and that your life's where it should be. And then that vision passes out and gets, gets bigger. It gets to the people that normally attend this church, to his flock, to the people that he's invested in their lives, and even out to the, to the visitors that are coming. Maybe it's your first time here. Maybe it's your first time in a church. And I know that he spends time praying through uh, how to present the message and, 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 to, and to have the Holy Spirit work uh, and communicate with all of you. You are the people that have been given to him, and he's been given to you. It's the same way for me. I'm not a pastor, but God's given me a group of people to care for. Uh, these children, these children actually, they live at a dump uh, in Kenya. There's about 400 people that live at this dump. Uh, it's in Nakuru, Kenya. 130 of them are kids under 13. And then there's a neighboring slum that has about 3,000 people. So it's really that group of about 3,500 people that when I read the scriptures, you know, God filters it through my life, but then it's like, how can I help these people that have been given to me? I've been given to them, and they've been given to me. And it reminds me of um, Proverbs 31, which says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. These people do cry out. They cry out uh, in the middle of the night and nobody hears them. So God said, Dave, you're going to be their voice. I love these people so much. You can see the kids, right? How can you not love those kids? Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. This is what home environment looks like um, for those children. When, I mean, think back to the leapfrog and the, and the jumping jacks. But this is where they return home to uh, every night. And actually, the reason that we started uh, our, our preschool was because if you look in the lower right-hand corner there, you'll see the, the young man, um, he's got a bottle in front of him, and that's actually glue. It's cobbler's shoe glue. It's the stuff that puts the sole on the bottom of your, of your shoes. And, and when, when we first went to Kenya in 2007, we spent a lot of time out with the street orphans. Almost every kid that lives on the street that is an orphan uh, they're called street boys or street kids. Um, they all sniff glue 24-7. Um, they don't really do it to get high. They do it more so to satiate their hunger, to uh, uh, help them fight the cold at night, uh, and also to make them a little bit more brave to do some of the things that kids have to do to survive on a street. And then it's become a social thing, where since everybody on the street's doing it, they're going to be doing it. The problem is, is that it's glue. It's an organic solvent, and it's only like a couple inches away from your brain. And so by the time a child's been out on the street for even six months, they all suffer from irreparable brain damage, and uh, they've got a pretty tough go from there. So God put on my heart, what can we do to help these kids? Um, we can see the next slide. Because when I went to the dump, this is what I saw. This is the image that God burned into my heart so much that I couldn't rest, and I had to do something. It actually made me get to the point that it was like, okay, you got to just quit praying about it, Dave. You got to just quit asking other people to do it. I want you to do it. I want you to do something about it. I'm a st I was a stockbroker. What do I know about dumps and preschools and stuff like this? But I know God, and I know the one that can do something about it. And so yeah, there weren't actually preschools in this area of the country at the time. And when I asked the locals, what should we do about this? There's four-year-old kids, three-year-old kids hanging out there. What should we do? They said, well, Dave, when they, when they turn seven, you can help sponsor them and they can go to school. And I'm like, but I'm not going to wait. I got to do something now. What can we do for them now? And I think it was the American in me that said, you know, we're problem solvers. Let's do it. Let's start these schools. That's what we did. And so um, we can take a look at the next slide. I love this slide, actually. Because these are two of our students in their, in their home environment. But if you look at the look on their faces. They have no idea they live at a dump. They're just kids. It's where they play. It's where they hang out. It's just what they do. They're joyful little guys. And you see lots of pictures like this from kids in Africa and other third world countries. But what you don't see is you don't see lots of pictures of joyful 15-year-olds that live at dumps. Because they know where they live. They know what their uh, future holds. These kids don't know. It's awesome. 
So that's why we started the preschools. We can get them now when they, when they still think that life's just awesome wherever you are. We get them into school. We, we uh, have Bible teaching. We have teachers that love them. They get fed a couple meals a day. Um, they experience the love of Christ through our, through our staff. And they have a whole different life. They have a different uh, chance in life. They have a life that's full of potential. Um, so I want you to think of my kids like this because that's what they are. They're just awesome and fun and I love them so much. Um, can we do the next slide? Here's what the school looks like. Um, right now, that's actually not the school building. That's a, a house for our caretaker. But that's what, that's what the kids look like. Uniforms are really important. It says, I belong. It says, I'm, I'm on my way. It says to the whole community as they march off to school, it tells them, hey, these kids have a chance to get out. But that's our school right now. We have 61 children uh, that are attending school. About a month ago, uh, my wife and I got a text from our staff in Kenya. And I'll tell you what, technology is amazing. I love it so much because we talk with our, with our staff, our all Kenyan staff, at least once uh, every day. We communicate and touch base. It's great. Um, but I got this text and it said, you want to go to the next slide? It said that we're going to, uh, the government's going to expand the road. This is the road in front of our school. We're gonna, they're they're going to they're gonna expand the road a little bit and they're going to tarmac it. They're going to pave it for us, which is great because it's so super dusty there. And then as I read on, they said, but uh, on our walls, the walls of our school, they painted these red X's. And on all the businesses up and down the street, they painted these red X's. Um, what does it mean? What's going to happen? And then the government went through and started knocking down all the buildings with red X's on them. Uh, you can go ahead and... I actually love this one. Do you, can you see the, the name on there? Can you read it up on the... Uh, up here? It says Babyface Kenyozi. Sounds like a mobster, right? <laughs> it's, but it's, but it's Babyface Kenyozi and phone changing. What a Kenyozi is, is a barber shop. So you can get your hair cut and you can get credit for your cell phone all right there at the Babyface Kenyozi. Um, but you know what? Babyface Kenyozi has a red X on it. It's not going to be there. Um, Let's go to the next slide. So all those businesses right there. Our school is located just above that, uh, where that big tree is. Even that tree, it's 100 years old. It, lay, it lies about a yard outside of, our, of the new boundary. Um, but we're praying and asking the government to have mercy on us because there's two trees there, Adam and Eve, that's what they were named, um, that uh, provide a ton of shade for our kids in the hot African sun. Um, and here you can see where they've already knocked down some of the businesses. Uh, those two water tanks, that's the sole water source for the people that live at the dump. The, the, the women primarily walk uh, five to ten minutes with jugs, uh, empty jugs to fill up uh, there at the, at the water tank. The water tanks have red X's on them too, so they're going to have to be relocated. We're just praying that we can find a place uh, to put them so that the folks there can have water. Um, and uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. So one of the great things about having no house and no possessions is that you have a lot of flexibility in your life. Bob right now is actually learning about a lot of flexibility. He's been, he, some of his load here at the church has been, has been lifted and he has this flexibility for all these divine appointments that, that happen. Well, for my wife and I, when we got that text and we read it, I could sense the fear in it. For some reason, the spirit of God just came on me and said, my staff is afraid. They don't know what's gonna happen. They're uncertain. And so two days later, Kim and I boarded a plane and flew to, flew to Kenya. And we did it because we love our staff. The, their first thought was, oh no, why is the boss coming? Why is Dave coming? Is he going to be mad? I don't know if you guys look, I'm not a mad guy. Um, I might be mad in terms of the things that I do, but I'm not, I'm not angry. Uh, but, you know, what's he going to do? Is he going to be mad? Is he going to cut our salaries? Who's going to pay for the, you know, our, our walls are going to get knocked down. Our toilets are going to get knocked down. Our water storage is going to be gone. Our electrical power station is going to be gone. Um, they were afraid. Were we going to close the school? And, you know, the big guy's on his way, and he's probably going to clean house because that's what happens in Kenya when, there's, when somebody makes a mistake. We were going to give him a hug. We were going to tell him that we love him. 
We were going there to encourage them. And it's not really a Kenyan thing to, to just have this big embrace. They're kind of a proper society. They'll shake hands and have a cup of tea. But I was going to give them an American hug and have a cup of Kenyan tea just so we could all say we're okay together. So we had our first staff meeting. Everybody sat together, and I really just listened. And their, their culture's um, not like ours in terms of communication. If I asked them, so tell me, how are you feeling about what's going on with the road out there? They would say, oh, there's some challenges. They won't open up about, about what they're feeling. And so it takes a brave Kenyan to actually say, we're afraid, we're scared, we don't know what's going to happen. Why is this happening? But we went through our first meeting. We had an opportunity for all, each staff member to share with us what their concerns were. And it was a good meeting because it just began to bond us closer and closer together, uh, as we should be as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our second meeting, we progressed a little bit more. And we kind of got past the point of being afraid of our, for ourselves. By our third meeting, a beautiful thing happened. This is what I was praying for. I was praying for God's leadership. I was praying, God, what do you want us to do as an organization? And he said to us, you know, this is a tough thing for you guys. It's going to cost some money. It's going to take some time. They don't like to see the progress get pushed back. Um, but you know, your neighbors, some of them are going to be dev devastated. Because the baby face Kenyozi was all that they had. That was their business. That was everything. We may get a setback, but they may be devastated. And so, <laughs> I love my staff so much. They said, you know what we want to do? We want to throw a party for the neighborhood. We're going to have everybody over. We're going to love our neighbors. And that's what we did. It was a beautiful day. We invited the whole neighborhood. Yeah, let's hang on. Let's stay on this picture for a minute. Um, that's what we did. Tons of kids showed up. We actually had about 250 people over for lunch that day. Um, this picture really illustrates the difference between being American and being a Kenyan. Uh, in Kenya, the, the adults, they'll sit in seats of prominence. And especially if you're the guest of honor or the host, I would be like sitting up here somewhere right now talking to, to all of you. Uh, but my heart, my heart is to be, actually I don't like being up there as you can tell. I won't even stand behind the pulpit up there. I want to be out in the middle of all you guys because we're together in this. And so I just go and sit on the lawn. And what happens is all my friends, all these kids, just come and start sitting around you and pile around you. And then when it's time to stand up, I am by far the tallest kid in the class. And uh, I love it. It's, it just makes you feel part of it. Um, can we take a look at the next slide? So we, so we served the, everybody a meal. It was incredible. I mean, look at that's what a five-year-old Kenyan can, kid can put down on a Saturday. It was awesome that this was on a Saturday. Because our children, you know, they come to school, but they eat Monday through Fridays. But when they go home to the dump, most of the kids in our preschool don't get fed on the weekends. Because if you're a, if you're a mom and most of the people that, are, most of the people that live at the, adult, that the, the adults that live at the dump are women, if you're a single mom and you have five kids and one of your kids is in our preschool and gets fed Monday through Friday, they're probably not going to get fed because they're going to, they're going to take those resources and feed one of their other children. So for our kids to get an extra meal, and especially a potato, a whole potato, my wife peeled um, a ton of potatoes. I think we peeled 300 potatoes that day. She's really slow at it, she found out, because they don't use peelers. They use a knife, and they just like, do this spiral thing. And she's going, how are they going so fast? So she was sitting with our staff like this, and those ladies had a pile of peels like this. And here's my poor wife's little pile, and they're like, Oh, so sorry, Kim. Are you okay? It's like, do you, do you peel potatoes or do you have someone that does that for you? <laughs> and she's buckling down going, I'm going to peel this potato. So, so it was great. It was great to bond everybody together in that way. Um, so, the, so the kids got fed. There's, there's my sweet wife uh, of 10,122 days. Thank you, baby. Love you. Um, the kids, they, they all got, got a meal. Um, in fact, if we look at the next slide, um, they all got a soda. Sodas are 30 cents. Every kid got a soda. Every, actually, everybody got a soda. The, the community said, this is like Christmas for us um, because everybody got together, and it was a celebration. They had a great meal, had some, some good time together. 
Um, you can go to the next one. It gave me an opportunity to, to further connect with the community. These are not only parents of our, of our uh, students, but also some of the business owners and some of the people that lived in the neighborhood. Uh, what was really interesting, we had about 80 adults show up. And 79 of them were women, and there was one man. That's a big issue, right? One of the things that, I, that I've learned in, in some of the different places that we've gone is that men do leave their babies. Women don't leave their babies. They stick with them, even if it means that they're going to live at a dump. And so it had an opportunity for me to meet all of these ladies in the community, and we did a sharing. I did a, I did a, a teaching. We had activities. We sang songs. We did some worship. And what I noticed was that three ladies in the community stood up and spoke, and every head in that community turned and watched them. These aren't people of prominence. They're just people of influence. We can be the same, by the way, in our communities, right? We don't have to be people of prominence to influence people to Christ. But the whole community paid attention to what they were saying. And I made note of who these people are. Next time I'm in Kenya, which will probably be November maybe, um, God willing, if that's where he wants us, um, I'm going to sit down with those three ladies and say, ladies, this is your community. What do you want to do? How can we help you? How can we work together? What do you want to do? Um, but it was a wonderful opportunity for people to come uh, together. There's a, little, there's a little bit of the group. Um, I'm going to teach you a new Swahili word. I want everybody to learn it. Are you ready? First word's penda. Jirani. Yako. Let's try it all together. Penda, jirani, yako. Very good. It means love your neighbor. I'm not going to try the Hawaiian one. Is that right, Bob? For, sort of. That's Google's uh, translation of love your neighbor. Malie? How, how are we doing? Is it Okay. Okay. Well, no matter how you say it, it's love your neighbor, guys. That's what God tells us to do. Love God, love our neighbor. If we just focus on that, amazing things happen. Because the red X's in life happen. This, is a red, this was a red X to my school. It sent a lot of fear. It was unwanted. It, was un it created uncertainty. You know, this church right now is going through a red X. With Bob's situation, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. I'm sure that there was a lot of fear early on. I'm sure there still is. I mean, I, um, I'm still wrestling with God on it. I love Bob. I love you, man. You're my friend. Um, I learned so much from him in such a short period of time. Bob's one of the friendliest people I've ever met. I'm 56 years old. I didn't know how to make friends until I met Bob. And I met Bob in February. It's not so funny, you guys. Come on. I knew how to do stuff, but uh, I didn't know how to make friends. But Bob's the friendliest guy I know. I've met thousands of people. But he's teaching me how to be a friend. And that's how you have friends, right, is to be one. He's also taught me about prayer. And so is this body. This church body is incredible. Prayer is just part of the conversation here. God's always invited in. You'll see, you'll, after this service today, you're going to see this church body paired off in little groups and everybody's going to be praying for everybody. It's amazing. That's the way it should be. Um, and so I want to thank you for that. Um, and I do want to pray over you, Bob. Why don't some of you guys come in? Let's put hands on this man, okay? Oh, Heavenly Father, I don't, uh, I don't really have adequate words uh, to express how much I love this guy. I thank you for the blessing that he is in my life and in all the lives that he's touched and that you've touched through his service. Lord, sometimes I don't understand your will. I don't question your will. But I'm really asking you, if it be your will, that you would heal him. Lord, I know that you, you've made the blind to see and you've had the lepers be healed and you've 
made the lame to walk. You've even raised people from the dead. So I know you have the power, Lord, to send every one of these cancer cells out of his body or to make him healthy. And I ask that you do it. I ask that you would heal this man in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Jesus. And we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> you got it, brother. Thank you. That's one of the great things about the Spirit of God is sometimes you lose your place in life and you don't control it anymore and He just takes over. Um, so when, as you've heard my, my story and what my wife and I are doing, uh, you might be surprised to know that I didn't grow up in a Christian household. I think I went to church twice uh, as a child, once on an Easter and once on a Christmas because that's what good people do. Um, my parents were members of a church. We just never went or read the Bible or anything like that. Um, and... Uh, um, I was taught that you could do anything you wanted as long as you put your mind to it. Are there other people out there that were taught that growing up? Okay, well, if we look at the next slide, um, right here. Here's Shaquille O'Neal. He's seven foot one, 325 pounds. And Simone Biles, she's four foot nine, 104 pounds. What I love about this picture, look at the heels. I mean, she's really trying to catch up with him there. But, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can do amazing things. And I'm not telling you not to dream here. But what I am telling you is that it's a lie to say, I can do anything that I put my mind to. Imagine Shaq saying, you know what? I'm going to be the best in the world at the uneven parallel bars. <laughs> right? And Simone saying, I'm playing center for the Lakers. These were the best people out of 7 billion people on the planet at what they do. But it was a lie that I was told by my parents that I could do anything that I put my mind to. I believed it, though, because I was their kid, and I heard it over and over and over again. And that's what I did. I was told achievement is the goal. So I wrote down everything I wanted to accomplish when I was 17 years old. I put it in a drawer. I took it out every morning and read it. And I would be very embarrassed to tell you guys what was on that list because it was so worldly so wealth-oriented, so achievement-oriented, so building a monument to Dave-oriented. Um, the God I worshipped was the one that stared back at me in the mirror. Um, and so I, I worked my way through school. I was one of the youngest people ever hired uh, on Wall Street for, to be a broker. I worked in Beverly Hills. Um, I've, my career continued to advance. I worked everywhere except Goldman Sachs, because I chose not to. I actually turned them down a couple of times. And the people that we dealt with were super wealthy, worth hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. I had one client, and I mean, we, I have amazing stories, but I had one client that, she's a famous rock star. You'd know her name if I said it. Um, she had an account with us for three million bucks for the benefit of her cat. Okay, so that's what the world turns into. When, when we just seek ourselves. But, uh, you know, everything that I wrote down on that list, I accomplished by 35. And from 35 to 40 were the driest five years of my life. Right, honey? It was tough. It was a tough time for us. And it all changed because of God's intervention. Uh, my business partner, my best friend and business partner, walked in one morning and said, hey, Dave, I'm taking the business from you. We'd sat next to each other for 15 years, split everything 50-50 down the middle, no contracts, no anything. We just came in and did our best. Um, he was actually the guy that had uh, discretion on my health care power of attorney to pull the plug on me after my wife. So that's how much I trusted him. I don't remember much of the conversation after I'm taking the business from you because the world was spinning and I just couldn't believe it because when achievement is your God and that's taken away from you or threatened, it was just a tough time. And so actually about a month later and through, through a lot of discussions, uh, no prayer because I didn't pray yet, uh, but my wife and I decided to move to a small town in Northern California where we raised our kids and we stumbled into this church, a little tiny church, maybe 30 people in it, a little nice white steeple in a small mountain town. 
And you know who was in the front row when I got there? Jesus was in the front row. He'd been waiting for me for all that time. He'd been waiting for me for 42 years. And my life was never the same. My American dream life switched over to a biblical dream life. And you know, the same is true in some respects for the author of the passage that we're going to look at today. Um, he grew up in the, in the wealthiest country on, on the face of the earth. He was a Roman citizen. He grew up in a college town and he had the best teachers. He, he was a superstar student, a great lawyer. He became a lawyer. He was on the fast track. He may have been on the Sanhedrin. Um, he, was, he was famous. He was amazing. And this is, of course, Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Um, and his life changed when he met Jesus on a Damascus road. So when he penned these words, Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. So when Paul wrote down, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, he knew what he was talking about. He said, don't do what I did. I, I followed the Roman dream. Don't do it. Look what happened in my life. I became a great executioner of Christians. That's what the world did to me when I followed it. Don't do it. So when I look actually um, at some of the things that have been transitions in my own life, I don't watch TV anymore except for some sports because I don't want to think like the world. I look at what our nation went through in this last election and how divided and how ugly we were as a people. It's not just outside the church gang, it was us. Went to a, churches all over the place and I'm telling you, the body was ugly and divided. If, we sounded like CNN commentators on one hand and Fox News commentators on the other. And so if you want the mind of the media, feed yourself that stuff. But if you want the mind of Christ, there's a different way to go. It's right here. God's given it to us. It's his word. It's beautiful. It's written for all of us and each one of us. It's written for you. And it's written for you. It's written for me. And the awesome thing, what God's been revealing to me is, he says, Dave, he goes, you know, this is, you can follow the world and, and have achievement and everything. But you know what? If you follow this, this word that I've given you and you change the way you think, you get so much more. You get me as a bonus. You get a relationship with me, the creator of everything, the one that knows everything, the eternal one. You get so much more. You get life. So as we look at, um, you want to go back just one, one more? Um, and it goes on, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you'll know what God wants you to do. You know, we were here in February. We spent a lot of time with uh, some of the, the young people that were in uh, Kauai Bible College here. What an amazing group of people, you guys. We got asked so many times, do you think I should get married? Do you think I should go on this mission trip? You know, what should we do? What does God want us to do? What I loved about their questions was, their heart was, what does God want me to do? Everybody wants to get to this part really quickly. God, tell me what you want me to do. But it's the then part that takes the work. Because what we have to do first is have our thinking change, right? Right? If we want to know what God wants us to do, we've got to think like God. We've got to push the world out and pour God in. Then we'll know what God wants us to do. And if we go to the next one, here's what the notes in my, my Bible look like. So I've taken a little bit of um, uh, leeway here, but let me share it with you. 
So don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, or else you'll learn to think like the world. And if you think like the world, you're going to act like the world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And after you change the way that you think, then you'll know what God wants you to do. And then when you do what God wants you to do, you'll know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. You'll find out how awesome God is and how much he loves you. That's what that passage says to me. And it goes on. So as God's messenger, I give each one of you this warning. Be honest in the, your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. Don't measure yourself by the way the world measures us, right? How do we measure ourselves in the world's eyes? How big's your house? How much money do you make? What golf score did you shoot last Saturday? What are your kids doing? All these things. But God's saying, Measure your value by how much faith you have. There's some commentators that substitute the word allegiance in the place of faith there. Measure your value by how much allegiance you have to God. How close? How, much, how close is that bond to God? That's what's important. If we can go to the next slide. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. It's, I'm really dwelling on it right now, you guys. It's from Galatians 5, 6. It says, what is important is faith expressing itself in love. So it's not just having that faith. It's got to come out. We have to do something. In my case, God said, you're going to express that love to this community of 3,500 people. You're going to love these kids. You're going to help them with everything you've got. You're going to come to Kauai and you're going to share their story with these people because that's what I want you to do. That's your specific calling. It's not right for everybody but it's, it's mine. And so here's a little bit of what we're doing right now. Uh, those are empty shell buildings. They've been there for over 10 years. Right now we're finishing those as uh, classrooms so we can have 75 kids in school. I'm just showing you the high-tech Kenyan construction. Uh, we can go to the next one, but that's where, how it looks now. Uh, we'll have that school, that, this building done in, in about a month so we can have some more kids in. Um, there's a little more of the school. And uh, guys, that was 11 seconds. These guys do this all day long. This is how they take that stone structure and put a rough coat on it so that then they can go ahead uh, and plaster it. And that's what the walls are going to look like. Um, when they're done. You know, when you have 50% unemployment in your, in your community, in your, in your country, people work really hard. Those guys are incredible. I tried to keep up with them for about 15 minutes, and that was it. I couldn't do it. I, I, that's when I put my boss hat on and said, I've got things to do. Um, but uh, uh, they're incredible, and they do a great job for us. Um, here's what's next for us. God's told me, okay, Dave, you're done. He gave, I had 45 minutes of rest. He said, you're done. You finished up the school. We're going to have 75 kids. That's the most that can be here. You feed them a couple meals a day. They get uh, schooling and uniforms and health care and all the rest. And I actually rested. There was like a, a brief period where I kind of felt the pressure was off. And it was like, okay, gosh, I didn't let God down. He, he gave this stockbroker this dream to build a, a preschool in the middle of hell and said, and he did it. And then, about 45 minutes later, God said, now, guess what? We're going to do a lot more. I don't want you to just care for these kids five days a week. I want you to love the community in a deeper way. I want you to help their home life. I want you to do what Jesus did. I'm not Jesus, but we can do some of the things that he did. He said, I want you to help heal the sick. I want you to help people that can't see too well. I want you to help women that are having issues, uh, female issues or, or pregnancy issues. I want you to help people with their demons in their life. There's a lot of, the biggest problem at, for people that live at a dump, you guys, is not lack of food. It's not lack of a roof over their head. It's that they're in prison because they're so depressed and so full of shame 
and there's no hope and there's only darkness. They could walk right out if they chose to, but they choose to stay in that dump. There's no one there to give them a big American hug. And the church is absent. I have yet to find a church in Kenya that does any outreach. They're great at evangelism. They're great at worship. They're incredible. But they don't reach out to their communities. They don't go into the poorer neighborhoods and help out. And they don't walk alongside their brothers and sisters with discipleship. So God's telling me, Dave, we're going to do that. So we're going to hire Kenyan counselors, Kenyan biblical counselors, to provide that role that the church should be providing, to walk alongside these people, to get to know them, to go into their houses, to love them, and to bring them out. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to build a health center. We can build it for 37 bucks a square foot. You can build things a little cheaper in Kenya than you can in Kauai. This is the current health facility for 3,500 people, maybe even a, a little bit more. That's it, by the way. It's not just a snapshot of it. It's that little white part. It's about 10 feet by 10 feet. That's the doctor. He's actually not a doctor. He's a clinical officer. And if you go to see him, you can go to the next slide. If you go, there's the, that's the, uh, the hospital. If you go to see him, you're going to get a shot, no matter what you have. If you have the sniffles, you're going to get a shot. If you have malaria, you're going to get a shot. If you have a bone sticking out of your arm, you're going to get a shot. So our staff will go, you know, oh, I wasn't feeling well. I went to the doctor, I got a shot, and I feel a lot better. And that's what they do. If you're sick, you're going to get a shot. Bob, you get a shot. That's it. Good luck. And God put it on my heart. He said, you know what? We tend to do the same thing in our spiritual lives. I get a red X. Where's my, where's my devotion of the day? Where's my scripture of the day? Right? Something happens in a relationship in your life that's important. Oh, you know, I'm going to pick up this little pamphlet and I'm going to go to the restroom and I'm going to read it. I'm going to get a shot. I'm going to give myself a little spiritual shot. But we all know that if we want to live healthy lives, if we want to be healthy, right? You got to eat right. You got to exercise. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Get some sleep. Relate with people. Get out, have friends. It's the same thing in our spiritual lives. We're not going to be healthy if all we do is give ourselves these little shots. So let's change the way we think. Let's pour this into our hearts. Let's have fellowship with our brothers and sisters. And it reminds me of Psalm 1 where it says, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. That's what we want to do. We don't just want shots. We want to plant ourselves next to a nourishing stream so that we can have full lives. So here's where our health center is going to go. It's going to go right there, with a, which was formerly goat pens. Um, there's some of our staff, hopefully, in a few years, some of our kids. Um, this is a rendering of what the, what the facility is going to look like. We treat Jesus heals, you bet. That's the way it works, right? And if we look at um, this facility, there's a, there's a large uh, open atrium there. It's going to allow us to have medical, mobile medical teams in, dental teams in, where we're going to be able to treat hundreds of people in a single day. That's also going to be the place where those three ladies, where the idea that those three ladies come up with for how they want to help their community, where we're going to, where we're going to encourage that. Is there going to be sewing classes? Are we going to teach computer courses? What can we do? Are we going to teach hygiene, hygiene courses? That part's going to come from them as to how we use it. But that's what our facility is going to look like. Um, these were my doctors when I was there uh, just a, a few weeks ago. They gave me a pretty good checkup, although they said lay off the ice cream. <laughs> so I'm thinking about getting a different doctor. <laughs> Romans 4 and 5, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to one another. That's it, you guys. Love our neighbors. We're all part of this body. You know, my calling has been for this specific area. Yours, 
is probably for something different. But if we all do our part, this is what this scripture is telling us. If we all do our part, we're going to be a healthy body. So let's do it. Um, my son pointed this out. He said, you know, he goes, Dad, he said, Mondays in, in the U.S., a lot of people are bummed out on Mondays because they, they have to go to work. Weekend's over, playtime's over. Oh, I've got to go back to work. But for our kids, Mondays are the best day of the week. Because like I said, many of them don't get fed over, over the weekend, right? So Monday comes, and all they're thinking about is 10.30 porridge. So what we tried to do, and, and because we celebrate Mondays in our school, I've started sending out an encouragement every Monday to, to, to people. And this is an example of one of the, one of the things that we sent out. So yes, guys, you can talk to Jesus every day, yep, no matter where you are. Maisha Mapia, by the way, means new life in Swahili. So now you know five, five words. Maisha Mapia and Penda Jiraniyako. Love your neighbor. Um, here's my cell phone number. We're here for another until August 15th. We don't really know where we're going after that because God hasn't told us yet. Uh, that's just the way that we roll. Um, but if anybody wants to get together, have coffee talk about anything. You know, sometimes it's easy when there's a stranger that comes in from another place that, that, that you want to talk uh, over issues with. My wife and I are happy uh, to meet with you um, to help you with that next step uh, with Jesus. Okay. I want to meet a doctor. I'd love it if you guys would be my focus group on this because I just put that together and next week we're going to be telling more people about what we're, what we're trying to do there at the dump. So if you have, if, I'd love your feedback uh, when we're done here if you think that that tells the story of what we're trying to do. Um, but let me close with this because this is really what it's about. I've shared um, with how God has led us, my family, step by step in this process to get to the point that we're actually going to, seriously, we're going we're gonna to build a hospital in the middle of hell um, because God told us to. I would have been so scared 15 years ago when I first became a believer if God said, you're going to do this. Because it's not in the stockbroker playbook that when you turn 56 years old, the most awesome thing you can do is go hang out in dumps and slums. But God can transform us step by step to do amazing things because he transforms our heart. He changes the way that we think. He makes us into new people. And that's what he's done. So I'm asking you, what's your next step? 
What's your next step with Jesus? Maybe this is the first time that you've heard about Jesus. Maybe, you're, maybe your next step is your first step. And if that's the case, please, I'm here. I know there's people in this church that would love to talk with you. Love to tell you about his love and what he can do. Maybe your next step is to say, you know what, I know about Jesus, but now it's time that I go ahead and change that playbook that I've been running with and get God's playbook and become a child of God. Maybe that's it. I'll help lead you to Christ too. I know it's one of Bob's favorite things. In fact, make his day. If you're in that spot, come up to Bob afterwards and say, Bob, here's another one for your next report. Um, Maybe your next step with Jesus is forgiving your mom or your dad or your boss. Maybe your next step is to forgive your kids. I don't know. Maybe your next step is to say, you know what, I don't just want a spiritual shot when I'm in trouble. Maybe, what I, maybe that next step is to get a steady diet of the word. Maybe it's to get more involved here in the church or your home church, wherever you are. Maybe it's to get involved. Maybe it's to help out in the kids' ministry or set up chairs or whatever it is. Maybe it's to go down to the beach and, and connect with the homeless community out there. There's guys that are hurting out there, you guys. Our neighbors, right two miles from here, need love. Like crazy. Maybe that's your next step. I don't know what it is. But if you pour your heart out to God, I promise you he's going to tell you. And don't be afraid. I get so many, well, how do I know if I should do it? Just take the next step. You know, don't, you don't need to see the whole path. It's too scary. <laughs> or too awesome. But uh, anyway, that's our story. I thank you all. I love you all very much. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to come and share. We're going to finish Romans 12. Uh, next week Um, and let me just leave with this so I pray that God who gives you hope will keep you happy and full of peace as you believe in him may you overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit Amen